Good morning, Timberlake. I'm TJ Martin. And I'm Brittany Martin, and we're excited that you're here with us this morning. Today, we're coming to you from our family vacation in South Carolina. We're starting week three of our series today about covenant relationships. We're talking about covenant as a basis for our relationship with God and each other. Examining the problem with all of our covenant breaking and pointing to the hope we have in Christ for our covenants to be restored. Are you new to joining us either in person or online at Timberlake? If so, we would love to give you a free gift. There's a link in our post to fill out our connection card. And after you do that, we'll send you a free gift. So I don't know if y'all have heard, but we're reopening our campus on July 26th. Which is only one week from today. You can find all the details on our website, TimberlakeUMC.org. Don't forget about our awesome online community within our Facebook group. There's a link in the Facebook post that'll take you directly to our group. We want to hear from you. We have lots of questions. We have lots of information. It's a great resource and a great way to connect with our community. Have you missed a message or a sermon lately? You can find the messages from our current series and also from our pre from previous series on our website. That way you don't ever have to miss out. Even when you're not at home. Okay, guys, we need your help. Since we're reopening on July 26th, we need all hands on deck. Fill out the form in the comment section right now to sign up to help. We all have a chance to be a part of this mission. It's so exciting, we get to reopen. Thanks for joining us today online. We're gonna go to the countdown. In the meantime, welcome each other in the comments section for some virtual community time. <laughs> we'll be back soon. Okay, we need a favor. Share the stream. Click the share button on Facebook so your friends can join in. We all know someone that could benefit from the message this morning. And we talk today about wearing masks. I have been loath to enter into the great mask debate of 2020, but I feel like I need to say something. Some of you are already convinced that it is good, or at least reasonable, 
to wear masks. I'm mostly interested in talking to those of you who are not convinced that it's good or maybe not even reasonable. So a couple things about this, friends. Uh, one, COVID-19 is a novel virus. It's new, right? We don't know exactly what it can do. We don't know exactly how it works. We are learning this as we go. So let me suggest to you, it's okay for us to say, I don't know. And I'm telling you, a lot of these things I don't know personally. Secondly, it's okay to change your mind. And I know in the political climate in the United States right now, changing one's mind can be equal to the end of your political career. Uh, but smart people change their minds all the time, especially scientists. That's how the scientific method works. You know this, right? You propose a theory, you do experiments which allow you to confirm or reject your theory and you grow in your understanding and you change your mind based on the current evidence. Welcome back everyone. I'm TJ Martin. And I'm Brittany Martin. And our service today is gonna have a time of music, time of prayer, scripture readings, and a great message as we continue our series, Covenant Relationships. So later in the service, there's gonna be a time for offering. You can give by text, you can give by mail, or you can give online. Your generosity leads to our mission to reach, feed, and release people to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Are you new to joining us either in person or online at Timberlake? If so, we would love to give you a free gift. There's a link in our post to fill out our connection card. And after you do that, we'll send you a free gift. All right, all you cool cats and kittens. We want to know who's watching with you today. Easy, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> it's digital community time. So welcome each other in the comments below and let us know who's watching with you today and where you're watching from. And don't forget about our rooted daily devotional online. It's got great content from our pastors and leaders. You can find it on our website at TimberlakeUMC.org. Okay, guys, we need your help. Since we're reopening on July 26th, we need all hands on deck. Fill out the form in the comment section right now to sign up to help. We all have a chance to be a part of this mission. It's so exciting. We get to reopen. Don't forget about our awesome online community within our Facebook group. There's a link in the Facebook post that'll take you directly to our group. We want to hear from you. We have lots of questions. We have lots of information. It's a great resource and a great way to connect with our community.
Okay, we need a favor. Share the stream. Click the share button on Facebook so your friends can join in. We all know someone that could benefit from the message this morning. Let's say, just for sake of argument, in six months from now, after more studies are done and we learn more about COVID-19, we find out masks are not as effective as we thought. Okay, the doubters, the cynics, the unconvinced, in that case, you would turn out to be right. So ask yourself this, what is the harm that has been done? We have been inconvenienced for a few months and then life goes on. But let's say in six months after more studies are done, we find out masks are as effective as some people are saying. Then, gee whiz, aren't we glad at that point that we have been wearing them? Yeah. Now, I'm not a betting man, friends, but I would bet that at some point uh, it is good in that case to be on the side of safety and of prudence, especially for people who are more vulnerable, um, especially for uh, people we care about. So it may not be you and it may not be me that gets really, really sick from the coronavirus, but it might be our parents or our grandparents or our kids or our friends. Friends, please don't let this be a political issue. It's really not unless we let it be. It's a question of loving our neighbors, of being willing to be inconvenienced for the sake of the gospel. So I am going to wear a mask, and I have been when I go into public places. joining us everyone we hope you enjoy the service today see y'all later bye
Welcome to worship. My name is Pastor Brad and we are Timberlake United Methodist Church. Thank you so much for joining us as we worship the living God together. Friends, I want to say to you that worship in your living room is just as real and authentic as worship in the church building. God meets us wherever we are. And so let your heart be lifted in praise and thanksgiving to the God who loves you. I want to encourage you as we make plans for reopening on July 26 for worship on campus, be patient, friends, and let us take this together one day at a time, one week at a time. We do not know exactly what the future holds for us, but we know who holds the future, and God will be with us as we go. We'll have more details for you later in this service during the mission moment about what to expect as you come back on campus. And remember that if you're not ready to come back on campus, that's okay. We will continue to have online worship. In the meantime, if you plan to join us, for, on, for on-campus worship, please, RSVP, let us know that you're coming so we can save a seat for you and be ready. Friends, now give your heart, give your mind, give your attention to the living God, and let's worship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together.
Hey friends, this is Pastor Matt, and I'm so glad to offer prayer this morning. Prayer is simply us realizing how big God is and how small we are and our need for Him. So if you would, let us unify ourselves together in our need for God in prayer. Let us pray. Father God, I say thank you. I say thank you for who you are. I say thank you that you are the strong ox that we are tied to and that in our yoke our burden is light through you. And so God, as you do the work, Lord, we come beside you and we ask that in that time that we get to know you. Lord, we say thank you for your intimacy. We say thank you for the knowledge of who you are. We say thank you for this time in which we are able to humble ourselves and to pray to the God who listens. So Lord, we ask that in this time we would hear from you, God, that we would be able to be energized through the things you say and that we would go forth in that to a world who needs you. God, we also recognize that we have fallen short of your calling in our lives, that we have fallen short to do the things you've asked us to do, and in that we have sinned against you and others. So God, we repent, we turn from our wicked ways, we turn around, we 180, and we go toward you. We turn away from our sin and we see your face. And you welcome us into your arms and we ask that in that embrace, Father, that you would show us your love and your compassion for us. Show us your grace and your mercy. Show us what it is to be children of the living God. And we exalt who you are. We say thank you for being our father, our daddy, the one who always welcomes us into your arms. And so God, we acknowledge that there is a world who is desperate that needs to know your love and that needs to have your embrace. And you have called us to be those who are ambassadors of yours, that we are children sent out to tell the message of our great father. And so Lord, we ask that we would embrace who you are and that we would look to have right relationship with you and with others. God, we ask that you would rend our hearts, that you would break our hearts for the things that, that break your heart, God, that you would show us an in intimacy, what it is to be your children. God, I ask that in this, that we would be able to see the deep, deep love you have for each other and that your justice would flow out of these things and that you would again show us what it is to treat each other how you treat us. God, we ask that you would ignite a fire of justice in our nation, Lord, that you would be with our leaders, God. We pray for our president. We pray for those who are in places of power, that they would see and seek your face and that in your wisdom, they would be able to lead out, to unify, to bring good things to this nation and to the world. God, we say thank you for our local leaders and those who are making decisions, whether it be school boards or principals or those concerning education, God, and we just ask that you would wrap your wisdom around them, that you would give them the ability to seek exactly what it is, the perfect understanding of what it looks like in this crazy time to be in school and those things. God, we ask that you would uh, give us the ability as well to lay down our own self and that you would allow us to embrace you first, uh, allow for our opinions to be last, and, and that we would be able to lay our lives down for our friends. God, in whichever way that looks, God, we ask to be a people of humility, a people of unity, and that your church would look beautiful in this time toward others. Lord, there are a lot of things that we can make look ugly, but God, we ask that you would make us look beautiful. So we ask for your unity. We ask for the ability to be together. God, I say thank you for Jesus. I say thank you for his life and what it looks like to have a life that is laid down. And he showed us that perfect example on the cross. And so God, we ask that you would give us the ability to look like Jesus in our lives. Lord, we say thank you for the ability to lay our lives down for others. God, in that you have taught us many things as well. And as Jesus was here on the earth, he taught us how to pray. And so we want to unite ourselves in this moment 
underneath the banner of what he taught us as we say these words together our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Hey guys, here at Timberlake Church, our mission is to reach, feed, and release people to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And this is the time in our service that we're able to talk about our mission. Next week, July 26th, we are going to be back in the building for worship. Praise God. And so I have a couple of friends, Debbie Lester and Gary Marple, who are going to share a little bit about what our expectations will be for us as we gather as a church again here in the building. Hi. My name is Gary Marple, and I'm super glad to be here. And I'm Debbie Lester, and I'm super, super glad to be here. So Gary and I are here to uh, give you information and details about what it's going to look like when you return to campus when we reopen. And we have three main goals that we want you to be aware of, and those are... Safety, hospitality, and excellence, Gary. You'll notice a few changes in the worship service. For one thing, there's no hymnals there. You won't get a bulletin. There will be no child care and there will be no nursery for you. We also are going not to be singing for right now. Uh, that's just something that we've decided would be the best way to reintroduce ourselves back into our worship experience. Uh, and then also, uh, as you leave the worship experience, there will be designated spots for your offering to drop it, or you can continue to give online like you've been doing since the pandemic started. Uh, it's going to be a shorter worship service because kids might be here as well, and it's going to be hard for them to stay entertained. You'll also notice that the hallways have been cleared of any areas that you could gather or congregate with your friends and family. We're going to stay six feet apart. We're not going to shake hands. We're going to do virtual hugs. And as always, don't forget your to mask. wear your mask. If you're coming to the traditional service, you're going to park right here and here and over by the annex with plenty of handicapped parking in both spots. If you're going to attend the modern service, you'll park here in the back parking lot and there will be parking lot attendants to help you. If you're coming to the traditional service, you're going to enter through entrance number one. That's the only one that you have to remember from the two parking lots to number one. So once you park, this will be the kids' entrance that you'll enter to the building for. Uh, there'll be people here that'll open the door so you won't have to touch anything, and you'll continue to feel safe as you enter into the worship experience. Now we're on the inside, air-conditioned comfort. You've come through door number one, and the door has been held open for you, and you'll be ushered to your seat by one of the church volunteers, and you're gonna stay six feet apart and you're going to wear one of these. So as you enter the Family Life Center for the Modern Worship, you'll be seated by hosts, and we're asking you to be seated together as a family. We're going to be maintaining social distancing of at least six feet. You'll be sitting together with at least four seats between family units, and then as you exit, we ask that you continue to move through the building, not stopping to congregate or visit until you get outside. Now we're in the sanctuary. You'll notice that every pew Every other pew has been marked off so that you can't sit there. Families can sit together, but we'd like to have four places apart between families. After our worship experience, you will exit the same way you entered the worship experience. You'll be guided by our serve team and volunteers that will ensure that you have not only a really great worship time, but a touchless experience for your safety. And we know that place is important for you. Uh, when the Israelites were in the desert for 40 years, they wanted a tabernacle and then a temple and synagogues. And we as Christians started with a card table and the catacombs. And we know that place is important to the sense of worship. And we want to welcome you back. So friends, it's exciting to think about all the opportunities that we're about to have in being able to gather again in in-person worship. This is directly because of your generosity. And so I want to talk about this time of giving that we're entering into in our service today. And there's three ways that we are now able to give. One is through check. Put a check in the mail, write out to Timberlake United Methodist Church and put that in there. Every day we have people coming in to make sure that those things are processed quickly and safely. Number two is text to give. That number will be on the screen in just a moment and it's an easy way that you're able to do your offering. And the third way of course is to go to TimberlakeUMC.org and give directly through our website. Isn't it exciting to think about what the Lord has for us here in the near future? 
Let us praise the Lord together through giving. Brothers and sisters, this is the message portion of the service when we open the scriptures and listen to what the Holy Spirit of God is saying to the church. So read with me from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 8. These are the words of the prophet. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Shepherds will sh strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast." Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion, and instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I've got a question for you today, friends. What is it that makes a civilization civilized? What is it that makes a civilization civilized? This feels to me like a really important question right now, as our usual ways of being civilized are being put to the test. What is it that separates us as humans from, say, a flock of geese or a, a family of bears or from some other group of humans from some other time and place. A while back, someone put this question to Margaret Mead. Margaret Mead was a world famous anthropologist. And one day, one of her students asked her the question What is the first sign of civilization? What is the first evidence that some group of humans might actually be called civilized? And her students expected her to say something usual like tools for hunting or religious artifacts or fish hooks or clay pots. But Mead didn't say any of that. Instead, she said a human thigh bone with a healed fracture. A human thigh bone that was broken and later healed. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, think like an anthropologist for a moment. What in the world would be so significant about digging in an archaeological site and finding the remains of a thousand-year-old village in which one skeleton, one person, had a femur that was broken and later healed? So Margaret Mead points out that if you're going to survive a broken leg, you need help. In the wild, if you break your leg, you're finished, right? You become lunch for some hungry lion. But a leg that is healed is a sign that someone else stayed with that person, bound up their wound, carried them to safety, provided shelter and food and water and protection. 
Now we have a word for this. We call it mercy. Mercy. We call it mercy, friends. It's that willingness to forgive as we have been forgiven. It is that desire to withhold punishment that is deserved. It is that divine drive to care for the least person in our midst, the person with the broken leg, the person with the broken spirit. William Shakespeare put it eloquently, the quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. One of the most essential marks of civilization, of our God-given humanity, is mercy. Mercy. The quality of mercy is not strained because it is freely given and it is freely received. Surely, friends, we are willing to give it, for surely we have received it. Welcome to week three of our series. It's called Covenant Relationships. We've been talking about this idea of covenant, friends, about the promises of God for God's people. Last week, we talked about the covenant of marriage, about our relationships with our family and with our friends. And today, I want to talk with you about what it looks like to keep covenant with the poor, about what it looks like to have mercy, to have love and caring for Jesus, uh, for the people Jesus called the least of these. One of my teachers from seminary, a man named Dr. Greg Jones, he has noted recently that the coronavirus is not the only pandemic we are facing. COVID-19's effect on our U.S. and worldwide economy has resulted in an economic pandemic. According to the World Bank, most countries in the world will have a recession in this year, in 2020, with per capita income contracting in the largest fraction of countries worldwide since 1870. The BBC reports that our U.S. economy is shrinking at the fastest rate since 2008. Since mid-March, more than 26 million people in the United States have filed for unemployment. And we have seen historic declines in business activity and in consumer confidence. The U.S. unemployment rate dropped to 11% last month after peaking at nearly 15% in April. A chief economist from Moody's Analytics has been quoted as saying, this is off the rails. It is unprecedented. The economy has just been flattened. So friends, if this has not affected you, it certainly has affected someone that you know, someone that you care about. I got an email on Tuesday of this week from one of our Timberlake people who said that after more than two decades with his company, he is being downsized. We are feeling this economic pandemic. And so we might ask the question, is there a good word from the Lord? Is there good news from God? Does the Bible have anything to say about economics and about how we care for one another in a crisis like this? And the answer is yes. Yes, absolutely. And so we open to the words of the prophet Isaiah. Now, when we think of prophecy, some of us think of predicting the future. And the prophets did that occasionally. But mostly what they did was to notice and name what was happening in the present. Mostly what they did was to look to the past and say, remember God's faithfulness to us in the past. The prophet's job was to enforce the covenant, to remind the people of God's promises and to call the people to be faithful to God, even as God has been faithful to the people. The prophets were always demanding that the people repent of their sin and they worship God and obey God's laws. But you got to realize, not in some sort of general religious way, like, hey, everybody, be good people. Not at all. Uh, the call to faithfulness came in a very particular context. It came in the context of relationship, of relationship with God and with one another. A call to remember their identity as the people of faith and that their job as the people of faith is to care for one another, particularly the least, to care for the widow 
and the orphan, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to provide for the resident alien who was living in their midst. And so the prophet Isaiah said in chapter 61, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Now that sounds good, right? And we know that is what God intends and that is what God will eventually do. But when you and I turn on the news in the evening or we go to the internet, we don't hear a lot of good news for the poor, do we? Uh, we don't see the captives being freed. We don't see the prisoners being released. We know what the problem is. What in the world is the solution to this economic pandemic? Well, surely, friends, the solution is at least partly political and legislative, right? We need legislators to make laws that help people rather than hurt them. Surely the solution is partly educational. We know that education has uh, the power to lift people out of difficult circumstances. We know that we need a reform of our broken health care system. So many people carry crippling medical debt. And I love, I love, love that many of you are already part of these solutions in our community. Many of you run small businesses, and so you provide jobs to people who need them. You educate children. You educate families. Uh, you work in channels of government and in public service and in health care to care for the people of our community. Friends, bless you. Thank you for your service. That is so wonderful, and we bless you for it. And yet, as necessary as these solutions are, we know they're not sufficient, don't we? We know that those things are not enough because the world needs the grace of Jesus Christ, which is where we come in. You and me and all of us together collectively because we are the church of Jesus Christ. We are the church. And so I wonder, what does it look like for the church to be part of the solution for economic problems in the world because of our faith in Jesus. Let me ask that again. What does it look like for the church to be part of the solution to the economic problems in the world because of our faith in Jesus? Well, the scriptures give us a clue, friends, and one of the best clues is from Acts chapter 4. And so I want to read you a brief story about what the early church life was like, about how the disciples who lived in the same generation as Jesus lived and worked and ate and, and had their common life together as they tried to figure out what it means to be disciples in a challenging world, about how to live together, about how to be a community. So this is from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Now, we're so used to individualism and to, to private ownership of our stuff that we read a story like that, right? And it sounds crazy to us. It sounds almost otherworldly. But this is how disciples of Jesus live, friends, according to the Bible. So a couple things from this passage. They are of one heart and mind. Right? In other words, they have agreement on what's important, namely loving Jesus and loving each other. They do not claim private ownership of their stuff. They don't say, hey, this is my land, this is my house, this is my John Deere tractor. No, they say, you know what, everything I have is from God. So let me use it, let me share it with my neighbors so that we can all have what we need. The story says they consistently give testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. It's the truth of the resurrection. It's their new life in Christ that is at the center of their common life. 
which means their motive isn't economics. Uh, because their lives are being transformed in Christ, one of the fruits of the resurrection is a fruitful economy for this early church. So those who had resources, they would sell a house or sell some parcel of land, and they would take the proceeds and lay it at the feet of the leaders, and the leaders would use that to take care of the people in the community so that everyone had what they needed. Now, maybe not everybody had what they wanted, but everybody had what they needed to live. And friends, once again, we are reminded everything is spiritual. Everything is spiritual. We know that our economic problems require solutions more than just economic solutions. They require spiritual solutions. We need people whose hearts are right with God and right with each other. Now, some of you will read a story like this from Acts chapter 4 and you'll say, oh, that's communism. That's communism. I know what that is. Not at all, friends. Not at all. All. Remember, we are not talking about economic solutions. We're talking about spiritual solutions that have economic implications. In the economy of God, there is an abundance that means everyone has enough. Everyone has exactly what they need because God provides for his children through the grace of Jesus Christ. Taking a story like this from Acts 4 and calling it communism is also what we call anachronistic. It's out of time order. Communism wasn't even invented back then. And more importantly, friends, notice the disciples were not sharing what they had because the government required them to. <laughs> not at all. They were doing it because this is what it means to follow Jesus. They were doing it because this is what Jesus required of them. I don't know about you, I have very little trust in the power of governments to provide for people. But I have great trust in God and God's people to be the kind of movement in which every person is included. And so we might take this story from Acts chapter 4 and, and call it intentional Christian community. Intentional Christian community. The disciples of Jesus taking the covenant of God so seriously that they are absolutely committed to taking care of each other, spiritually, medically, emotionally, economically. Now, this is not easy, friends. This is not easy. A living according to Acts chapter 4 would constitute a pretty radical shift for many of us who are listening to this story today. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure how you scale it. Because I can imagine pretty easily how you do this with a family of five. But I'm not sure how you do this for a city of 50,000. So I'm not sure how you scale it. But it's clear how you start. It's very clear how you start. Jesus started with 12 friends. You can start with your family. You can start with your life group and with your neighborhood. And what you do is you take care of each other and make sure that everyone has what they need. So that the one who loses his or her job is provided for, and the one who is hungry gets food, and the one who is naked gets clothing. And then what happens is you expand your circle, little by little, as the Spirit gives you ability, so you draw more and more into the circle of God's provision and love. In the heart of Timberlake, there is love for the poor. I know it. I know your heart. There is love for the poor. But I wonder, do we know who they are? Do we know people who are in poverty? I find many of us continue to be surprised at just how many hungry folks there are right here in Campbell County and in Bedford County. A good next step might be for us to do the work of learning about our neighbors, who they are, about where they live, about how we can bless them about how they can bless us. Friends, please get this. We're not really talking about charity. We're talking about community. We're not really talking about giving handouts. We're talking about being the hands of Jesus for those who are in need. We're talking about restoring the covenant that God has given us with our neighbors. Because God has promised to provide everything we need for abundant life. 
not just for us, but for all of God's children. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Let God's people say, Amen. Friends, thanks for joining us for worship. As we think about this idea of covenant, I know it's so much easier for us to get our heads around the idea of covenant with spouses and family and uh, with friends because we know these people and we love them. And so covenant with our neighbors and even with strangers and with the people in poverty in our community is sometimes harder to imagine. But understand this, God loves them just as much as God loves us. And so we are challenged, we are invited 
to love them as well in the covenant love of Jesus Christ our Lord. Friends, go in peace to love and serve your neighbor. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.